Okay. So what I'm going to do today is talk about From Thinking Machines to the Global Village. This is a book that I was published a few years ago. Won wonderfully won the Marshall McLuhan Prize. I said as I got up on the set. Uh, on the site, as a Marxist, I could not be more honoured than to win the Marshall McLuhan Prize, as you'll find out from watching this. What I'm going to talk about, assuming this solving thing works, aha, is the future is what it used to be. So, uh, people have talked about um, coming to this conference 16 years ago. Well, I was one of them. Um, and when I came here 16 years ago, I thought, ah, oh, the future is what it used to be. And it wasn't just because there was uh, the beginning of the revival of Deleuze and Guattari, the hippie version of Joseph Stalin's theory of linguistics. Um, it was more to do with actually what I'm going to talk about today, which is this vision that the convergence of media, telecommunications and computing into the net was going to create a new society. In 1995, we were just at the beginning of the dot-com bubble, so this sort of conference, like lots of conferences in Europe, in, in East Asia, and in North America, was being powered by this huge wodge of finance capital looking for a higher rate of profit. Um, and so, but the vision behind this, which is this is an advert from the late 1990s, from the infamous Wired magazine, and what it shows, it's a what Microsoft advert, what it shows is, I assume, Seattle or somewhere, which has become Moscow. So after the end of the Cold War, we are moving towards this idea of a global village, that everything is coming together. And this was presented at conferences 16 years ago and, uh, as, as something completely new. And at the time, I thought, oh, I've, see thought of, I've seen all this before. I mean, I'm, quite, you know, I'm now... Well, I'm going to be 55 next week, so even then I was quite an oldish person, and so I'd seen these predictions. Well, I'd seen these predictions before. Um, uh, and so when I started doing the research on the book, is what I wanted to do is to dig back to where did this prediction come from. Um, and uh, in particular, so when I was doing these researches, I found in my, uh, the photographs I'd inherited from my father this picture. So this is the 1964 New York World's Fair. Uh, that's my brother in the middle. Great, great pencil skirts and sling bag. That was you? That's me on the right, and that's my sister on the left. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, 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 the big... Uh, uh, for those who watch Men in Black, if you could remember, that's where the cockroach Kate went up at the end. Yeah, so this is called the Unisphere... And this is the symbol of the 1964 New World's Fair, which, as its name suggested, was that, that, that actually the whole world was being united in the centre of the world empire, that is New York, and technology was going to be the thing that united it. So, in a sense, what I was tr interested in is the way that the, these predictions, which I've lived through all my lifetime, just keep being repeated. So, as I said, one of the themes of this lecture is the future is what it used to be that we're continually resold the same futures again and again. And the lack, in a sense, if, by having a lack of historical memory of the future, we, we, we get fooled. So what I want to do today, hopefully, is inoculate you against this, particularly, as I, so I will argue at the end, in a sense, this future has come to an end. Right, so the New York World's Fair, this is, these are the various... Uh, corporate and, and uh, state pavilions. You can see the, the Unisphere in the centre, General Motors there. This is the New York State one. This great uh, US tyres uh, Ferris wheel, looking like a great piece of pop art, actually. Um, the key thing, though, in this, and this is what it relation to this conference, both back in 1995 and today in 2011, is about technology. That actually, that we are living today in the beta version of a better far, a future. And that only by understanding this future or believing in the properties of the future do we know where we're going. So there were three key predictions made at the New York World's Fair. The first, and as the seven-year-old Richard, this is the only thing I actually can remember about it, uh, is going to see the rocket in the space park. Um, I have to a little digression here. As, as a, a seven-year-old boy in 1964, I wanted to be an astronaut and I desperately wanted to marry a cosmonaut. <laughs> Valentina Terakova was one of my great crushes at the time. Uh, 
that, so that the prediction was that by 1990, we'd all be having holidays on the moon. That, they're, that they're actually the sending up one person into space or two people into space was just the pioneer of that we'd all go there, that it was something for everybody. The middle uh, 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 photograph is of the General Electric Pavilion where they showed a fusion reaction. And this was a prediction that electricity by 1990, thanks to nuclear fusion power, would be too cheap to meter. And the last one is the IBM System 360. This is the computer that basically, this your mobile phone is using the same architecture as this computer. Right? So this, and the, the prediction that they were going to make about this is that, is that by 1990, this machine would be able to think. It would be an assemblage, maybe we should say. Right? Right? Now, these, the New York World's Fair is not a new thing. I mean, you know, at, in 1964, the American Empire was at its height. It had 50% of the world's uh, industrial production. It had the biggest military power. Um, it was about to become a democracy and various other things. So it was actually at the top of its uh, uh, game. Um, and in this sense, making these predictions was not a surprise. So at the key one, as I said, is this IBM uh, site. This is the uh, you know, Sarin thing. It looks like a golf ball. Those who remember Mission Impossible at the beginning, it was actually like one of the... And you're sucked up and you saw this multimedia presentation by Ray and Charles Eames that's, that used the w their, their slogan, which is think. And the idea was that, that the, just in the same way as our brains work, so did computers. And so if that was the case, we could make a computer that was as good as a human brain. As I said, this sort of aspiration comes from a sort of imperial hubris. And in the because in the same way, a hundred years or so earlier, in 1851, in Hyde Park, there was the great exhibition of the wealth of all nations. And this in the same thing, that they that the British Empire said, well, we are the best, not bec because we own things like the steam engine and the cotton the, the, the machines that are making the industrial revolution in cotton and uh, other weaving things. So here you have, in the le left, you have all the plunders of empire. Here you have the Crystal Palace. It's the, first w the world's first steel and glass building. They seem to have made the re whole world like the, the Crystal Palace in the last 160 years. Uh, but it's the same idea that the, that, that the country that is the most powerful is not just because what it's in the present. And in that point, in 1851, England had 50% of the world's industrial production and the best navy in the world, it's because it also owns the future. And by owning the future, it has a right to control the world. Now, the New York World's Fair was in 1964 had been built on the site of the 1939 World's Fair. Now, this you can imagine, in 1939, America's coming out of the worst slump in its history. It had 25% unemployment a few years early. It had a 40% drop in production. Uh, after the great crash. So it was coming out of this uh, completely traumatic period in its economic history, and also, of course, the world system was collapsing in another civil war in Europe, war already, already in East Asia. And, but the prediction at the New York World's Fair of 1939 was that, um, that, that big business and big government together could rebuild and create a new world. And this would be this new world where instead of people living in slums in the, ci in the city in poverty, they would live out in the suburbs, they would drive in, they would live in these nice suburban houses with consumer goods. And this is the vision both from Futurama and Democracity, General Motors and the New York State, of what the future would look like in actual these big dioramas that were famed. By the time I got there as a seven-year-old, in a sense, this had come true. So this is what New York looked like. This is the fantasy in 1939. This is what they'd remade it in the 25 years since the 1939's World's Fair into, that it actually had come true. So you would have been forgiven for thinking that actually the predictions, which I talked about, that we were being given in the New York World's Fair of 1964, we would, be travel we would be having holidays on the moon. We would have free electricity. And we would have thinking machines. Would have come true by 1990, 21 years ago. Uh, 
what we, but of course it didn't come true. And I think one of the reasons for this is that because however, however purpose it could be used for military purposes, these, these, these Fordist technologies that we promoted in 1939, the ones that were promoted in 1964 were only being really promoted as military technologies. Or to be more precise, they were being hidden from being military technologies. And a good example is the computer itself. So if we think in 1964, what is the computer? The principal function is for the US military. This is the first on the left, is the first ever I, uh, IBM computer. It's called the defense calculator, in case you don't know. There were 17 of them made. They all were sold either to the US military or to weapons manufacturers. On the right is the SAGE uh, command and control system. This is the internet. This is the first, well, certainly in the West, the first iteration of the internet. It's where the graphic user interface comes from that you're all using on your laptops now. It's where the mouse comes from. It's called a light pen then. It was a technology designed so you so a computer system so simple that generals, admirals, and seven-year-olds could use it. Yeah? And so, so the, some of the basic technologies we take to grasp today come out of this idea. And of course we should know this because the history of computing is, inex is, is, is completely intertwined with that of the military. So, you know, the first attempt to build a computer, this is Babbage's difference engine, it was funded by the Royal Navy to make gunnery tables. On the right, you know, here we have Colossus, the world's first computer, built in Dolly's Hill in the late, in the, in, during the end of the Second World War. Uh, by Alan Turing and his team, Tommy Flowers. And, and again, it was used to crack German codes during the, during the war. So, uh, and actually, the way we think about computers comes out of this Second World War military research. This is Norbert Wiener, who actually wrote this seminal book about thinking, using the, the R&D uh, that he'd done in the Second World War into anti-aircraft gunnery, and a way of thinking about how computers work and introducing these ideas like feedback and information that we're using even today to actually analyze the way systems work. But there was a, prob that there was a problem with Wiener and his ideas, was that Wiener himself was a socialist pacifist. Not a good thing to be during the Cold War. Um, so he worked on anti-fascist um, uh, military research, but when the Cold War started, he said, this is crazy. They're going to blow the world up and refuse to work for the US military. So they got someone else. They got Johnny von Neumann. Uh, he was a Hungarian Jewish refugee, gone to the States in the 1930s after being a, a, a little time in uh, Germany in the 1920s when he'd helped to invent neoliberal economics, the things that we're all suffering from today. Um, and game theory, uh, he went to the States and he was a fanatical anti-leftist. His family had lost their bank when it was nationalized in the 1919 Hungarian Revolution. He helped to invent computers, he played a leading role in the invention of the atom bomb, and poetic justice died of cancer from going to too many atomic tests. But for us, the key interesting thing is what he, did he say the computer was. So if you think that, co that computer research in the 1950s is basically building guidance systems for bombs. Because if you think about what these three technologies I showed here are, are the rocket, the bomb in the middle, and the guidance system for the bomb. And so the purpose of computers is to blow up millions of civilians in Russia and Eastern Europe, and of course vice versa in the East. Uh, as, so he actually, taking ideas from both Babbage and Turing, said, well, actually, no, no, we're not actually organizing nuclear genocide. What we're doing is we're building artificial life. We're building thinking machines. And as he says in this quote, basically, if you build a big enough machine, it must think eventually. Yeah? That, that the valve is like a neuron. If we have enough valves, is in the brain, it will think. Yeah? Uh, so, of course, this is also useful 
as computers move from the military into everyday life. And we can see this, that actually in the early 60s it was making this transition computers from just being a military technology to what the IBM 360 was really designed for, which was to go into the office, to go, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, IBM itself had been set up, as its name suggested, as international business machine. Here on the left, it made, you know, it shows what it was made to function, it was analog tabulators. Large groups of semi-skilled, mainly female labor. If you give a, build a computer, especially if it's funded by the US military, you can actually theref therefore replace it with a machine. A classic case of capitalist investment in fixed capital to replace living labor, but also, of course, as Wiener pointed out, it's also, like all machinery, a disciplining effect on the working class. That one of the effects of technology is to transfer skill into the machine, but also to give power of management over the machine. If you think, believe that the, 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 the machine is a, actually alive and it's a robot slave, it's trying to turn us into a slave. But this, I think, is not really what, in 1995, when I came to virtual futures, is the most interesting thing. Is that the other prediction that they were making was not just that computers would come alive, but that you would have this convergence between, on the one hand, telecommunications, that's the Telstar, it's one of the little uh, circles around the, uh, the Unisphere, as it's the first satellite to broadcast television across the Atlantic, and, on the other hand, media at with the computer, converging into the, what we now call the Internet. And 1964 is all, not just when I went to the World's Fair when they launched the syst IBM System 360, but also the publication of this book, Understanding Media. And this, in a sense, is why I think you know, the future is what it used to be, because this prediction where, that we are moving from the, uh, the Gutenberg galaxy, that is this age of nationalism and individualism into this internet age, the global village, is still being peddled to us, to, peddled to us today. It was in 1995 when I was here at Virtual Futures, it still is. And it's, as he says, we are, you know, it's this implosion of the social. You know, anyone who reads postmodernism text, we'll see that this is absolutely saturated with these McLe this McLuhanist idea. It's interesting that a theory that claims to not believe in the grand narrative of history believes in this grand narrative with absolute certainty, that we're moving from this old past, the Enlightenment past, to this new postmodernist age. McLuhan says this, that technology, and particularly the internet, is what's driving us forward. Now, you can read, the, you know, if you read Donald Teal and people like that, they say, well, you know, McLuhan was a joker. He was just putting it on to wind up the American corporations and the American state. He was really a Catholic pessimist. But the key thing is that there's a difference between McLuhan and McLuhanism. And people like Tom Wolfe, who he's talking about here, is that they turned it into this sort of happy, clappy version of the future. Yeah, that convergence will create this utopia. This utopia is being pioneered in America. And it is, again, it's, you, know, you see this every few years where there's the latest book that everybody got, has to read. There's these new buzzwords. And McLuhan is one of those great things. Suddenly people had all these phrases like the medium is the massage and global village and so on and so forth, where they could, they could drop them in, make into their nice dinner party and cocktail party conversations. And they say, as I said, you know, I've lived through 20 or 30 years of postmodernism where it's the same difference. Um, but I think what we need to understand is that this particular theory, though it looks like it's just a sort of technological determinism, comes out of the era, the Cold War era in which it was born. So this is the era when the world was divided into two and that to create a theory of technology, and particularly a prediction of the future, is a statement in the battle between the two superpowers. And particularly because intellectuals were being mobilized for this job. Now, in early 20th century America, academics were these marginal characters. 
on the you know, so if they had money or they inherited wealth, maybe they were part of the elite. But after the Second World War, particularly after they proved that they could do things like create nuclear bombs and computers, they came right into the centre of the elite. People like Johnny von Neumann, for instance. Um, and it wasn't so... So people like him had, you know, esoteric knowledge about computing or about physics that got them in. There was another group of people who had another esoteric knowledge, and that was the knowledge of Marxism and other left-wing theory. Up to then, America had been ha quite happy to exist with its old liberal ideologies of its founding fathers. They'd worked all the way through the 19th century and the early 20th century, but once they got to the Cold War, they no longer functioned as credible theories of society. And so they had to mobilise ex-leftists, or even people who still thought themselves on the left, to create these theories of knowledge of how we would conceive a present society and where we're going to from the, using the ideas of the left. And in particular, we can see this in the ideas of people like James Burnham, who take the uh, no, ideas of Adam Smith, you know, the first ideas of the materialist conception of history and the wealth of nations, the ideas of the more statist founding fathers like Alexander Hamilton, mix them with Marx and particularly Trotsky because he was one of the four maximum leaders of Trotskyism in America in the 1930s and create a new theory for America. And it says that instead of... Now, Adam Smith says we go from hunting to herding to agriculture to commerce. Marx says we go from you know, tribal society to f feudalism to capitalism to communism. He says, no, 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 we don't go from capitalism to communism. What we do is we go from liberal capitalism to managerialism. And this gives a new idea of how to create a different form. It's a form of historical materialism, but it's a historical materialism for Americans ones that can be actually adapted for the imperial project. And particularly, as you can see, this is the, I have to um, I have a little digression here. The reason I'm at the 1964 New York World's Fair is my father is going to spend a year sabbatical at the MIT Political Science Department, on a, funded by the CIA. <laughs> every professor and every graduate student of the political science department at MIT in 1964 was also funded by the CIA, including and especially a character called Walt Rostow, who set up their cent what was called CNIS, their international, rather unfortunately named thing, uh, a group, which was their international research group. And he wrote for the CIA in 1960, the state of economic growth, a non-communist manifesto, in case you didn't guess what its function was. Uh, so what Rostow wanted to do was to show that there were these stages of growth where, where it wasn't that... So what the Russians were saying is that, look, we are socialists go, go, and we're about to become communists, so we might be poorer, more authoritarian, and not have as good military or even technology in some places as the Americans, but we are like a backward version of the future, whereas the Americans are just an advanced version of the present, capitalism. They've not... And Rostow inverted this. Rostow had been a member of the Communist Party of the USA in the 1930s, rallied to the anti-fascist cause in the Second World War, worked with the OSS, the fa precursor of the CIA, and became one of their leading theorists. And so what he says is that, no, no, America is pioneering the next stage of human history. We are, instead of, you know, instead of having these extremist ideas like totalitarianism, we are the vital centre or, and, and on the other hand, fascism, or as Daniel Bell would say, we are the third way. So, you know, I said, I always remember when Tony Blair was in power, and people would say, it's new Labour, and I would say, it's not new Labour, it's my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is what they believed in the 1950s. And so, what they wanted to say is that actually what we're moving towards, as Burnham says, are towards a sort of managerial form of capitalism. So they use these ideas from Marx, particularly social democratic theorists like Hilferding and Hobson and Calaisi, and to put forward in, play, in ideas like the affluent society that actually America is pioneering the next stage of human society, the affluent society. And certainly my mother remembers going to America in 1964 and the average American being two to three times richer 
than the average English person, let alone in other places in Europe. Uh, it's the place with the big cars, the big fridges, colour television and all the rest of it. And particularly at this period, of course, is that these people, the Cold War left, were actually in power. Uh, Kennedy had been elected in 1960, and this is Rostow in the top middle. Uh, there's Galbraith, who I, who, whose book was, I was just showed up, was the ambassador in, uh, in uh, India. And this, uh, he's at the bottom right, and this character with the telephone is Robert McNamara. They, they, they recruited this technocrat who ran the Ford Motor Company, was well known for, po for um, cost benefit analysis and was called appropriately an IBM computer on legs. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and what they were doing is not just implementing this idea of creating an affluent society, they were also actually solving the most basic problem with America. Because though America called itself the bastion of democracy, of course America was not a democracy in 1964 because millions of African Americans didn't have the vote. But the year after, America finally did become a democracy, when they did actually give universal suffrage to, every, to, to the entire population. So in this sense, you could see that the optimism was that their left of centre government was implemented. So America was not only the best, bigger imperialist power than the Russians, but it was actually more progressive than the Americans. But of course, as I say, one of the problems with it is that they didn't own the future. Um, I said you can't really see this, but it's worth having a look at this diagram. Uh, Daniel Bell was appointed to run a commission of the great and good of the American empire. So they have like academics and civil servants and people from think tanks, even have a professor of theology in it. And what they were brought together was to solve this problem. If you look at this, it's actually Rostow's stages of growth. And he, ha he made these different stages of growth. So there was like a traditional society, and then there's a wonderful mechanical metaphor to how it went through takeoff, yeah, and then it became an industrial society, and then it became the mass consumption society. This is where we were, where we were in 1964. But then it was going to do something else. Then it was going to go beyond mass consumption, and this is what this commission was set up to do. It was to invent a future for America. And so America could own the imaginary future. So the imaginary future says, we own the imaginary future because it's a beta version of the present. And but because we own the future, we have the right to control the present. And so it's a, it's a commission designed to not only to use this historical materialism for Americans, to actually invent an imaginary future for them. Right? And so the question, uh, uh, it's, it's worth looking at these predictions. That check it out on the... Uh, okay, so why would they... Why, w what's interesting is, 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 as I said, in 1964, they're already predicting. People like McLuhan are popularising that what is this imaginary future? You know, I always talk to my mother about this, about what were the great inventions in her lifetime? Well, she says, obviously, antibiotics and the contraceptive pill. Yeah, she said those are the important uh, inventions, you know, uh, not dying of, of pathetic diseases and women controlling their own fertility. But actually, it's interesting, what they pick on is the internet or the proto, the convergence of media, telecommunications and computing into what we now call the net. So the question is why? Well, the first obvious example is because the Russians were doing it. And I think this is one of the interesting untold stories. Uh, the, the in the 1950s, uh, a group of reformers came together in the Soviet Union. This was after the death of Stalin, the grandfather of Deleuze and Guattari. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and they wanted to break with this authoritarian system. And one of the ways that they wanted to do this was by, actually th by using computer networks. They built, like the Americans, a computer network for the command and control system for fighting nuclear war under this character called Axel Berg. He was the defence minister. He had lots of money, gave it out to academics. Now, they used ideas like cybernetics to break the Stalinist orthodoxy in sociology and biology, but in particular, to actually reconceive of how they could run the Soviet Union. And as this, this is a Polish uh, Oscar Lang, uh, as it says in this quotation, is that you could, not, you could take state planning and the market because that's the other implicit thing in this quote, is that get it safer, and replace it with the computer network. Right, now for us, you know, it might seem utopian, but it's 
But you have to understand, uh, and certainly I, I've talked to Polish friends who, whose father was, a, was active in the Stalinist government there, and he said they didn't have the co telecommunication systems, they certainly didn't have the computers. But the idea is not crazy. We go into a supermarket, and that's what barcodes are doing. The idea was that you'd have this cybernetic system to run the economy. But more than that, it would also solve the problem of the, do the, the totalitarian rule of the party. That the, the promise in the Civil War of France that the dictatorship of the proletariat is not the rule of the bureaucracy, but a, of the rule of the entire population. This is what Lenin had promised in 1917 in the State of Revolution and dropped immediately he'd seized power in the coup d'etat. Uh, <coughs> But they thought if you got cybernetics in its, in its uh, Wiener version, Wiener version uh, its socialist pacifist version, and added it to these ideas from Marx, you could actually create a system that not only was more economically equitable and efficient, but actually would be democratic. It would be a participatory democracy. So cybernetic communism is both an economic and a political concept. Uh, in 1968, the uh, Czechoslovak Art, uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences published this book, by, edited by Radovan Richter, called Civilization and the Crosser. It was the number one best-selling book, and it says Stalinism is industrialism. That's why we had to have all this tyranny and horrible stuff. Now we're about to move in to this new age of the internet where we can have participatory democracy and cybernetic communism. Um, not surprisingly, the bureaucracy were horrified by this idea. The last thing that totalitarian communists wanted was cybernetic communism, and the tanks went in a few weeks after this hit the, the bestseller charts. But, uh, by, but the Americans, by 1968, had already been sucked into this, because they'd been, the CIA had been predicting that, that a new cybernetics gap was opening up. Already, the, um, they had been humiliated by the launch of Sputnik in 1957 and the Yuri Gagarin's trip into space in 1961. They'd set up the Advanced Research Projects Agency to stop this, another Sputnik. And what they identified as the new Sputnik was the Internet. At the American Cybernetics Society meeting, again in 1964, McLuhan is there, with, with John F. Ford, the CIA expert at Georgetown University. And he, he and he says, the Russians are building the internet, we have to stop them. And so what they do is they employ this guy, Lick Lead, and Lick, to, to go off and pour billions, or millions, we should say, of dollars into the internet, to building the internet. You see, I always wonder, I never really believe those stories in the official books that says the internet was built, to, to have a, si a command and control system that would survive a nuclear war. Now, would you really replace cheap, reliable switches with expensive, flaky mainframes to survive a nuclear war? I don't think so. The other excuse is given it was to share computers between computer science labs in different universities. If you've ever worked with computer scientists, they hate sharing computers with people in the same lab at the same university. <laughs> right? So it seemed incredible. Once I realized did this research, I realized immediately why they were suddenly spending millions of dollars on it. It's because the Russians might beat them to it. This is, but it was more than this, is that McLuhan at this conference says it's not just about us beating them in the technological race, but crucially also in this, uh, this race to own the future. And this is, I think, the key thing. Again, I, look at these. These are the, Herman Kahn was a guy who in the 50s made great success by writing book called On Nuclear War, America Will Win Because We'll Only Lose 20 Million People. Uh, but one of the things he does do, and it's interesting in his list of 100 inventions, is he picks up all these things like cable television, uh, online learning, e-commerce, all this stuff in the 1960s. In 68, he's publishing these things. And of course, what they're saying is that we're not going to pick out these technologies, say, of health or uh, 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 of you know, travel even, it's the internet. The internet is the key transformative technology that will make, that's the one we've all got to be interested in. And it's codified by the guy who ran the commission towards the year 2000, it was called Daniel Bell, in this famous book called The Coming of the Post-Industrial Society. He was a Trotskyist in the 1930s, becomes the member of the Cold War left in the 1930s, uh, is a mate of people like uh, Burnham and Rostow. 
knows he's McLuhan, and so he uses this sort of historical materialism for America to say America now owns the future. It is the post-industrial society in the present. And this is where, in a sense, virtual futures comes in, because virtual future is another... That was 1971. So every few years, this prophecy has been resold to us. You know, one year it's the technotronic future, the next year it's the third wave, uh, and so it's the information society, it's the network society. It's rebranded again and again, but it basically they say what McLuhan popularised. We're moving from the Gutenberg galaxy, from nationalism, individualism, the industrial age, to this new glorious age of the convergence of telecommunications, media, and computing into the net. And this cut, again, I have to emphasize this, uh, is it comes out of the Cold War. This is a Cold War dream, right? Uh, you know, this, this is something that they propagated in organisations like the Congress for Cultural Freedom. I always have to put this up because my dad was a member of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, that it's part of the American dream where the opposition is also American. So this is great. If you read these, you know, it's like, you know, if you, it's interesting if you watch these sort of things like Adam Curtis. There's never, the Soviet Union never existed. Or Maoism or anything. It's not, the, even the opposition is American. Yeah? And so here, you know, we have... Jackson Pollock and Elvis and Ma Miles and all the rest of it. So it, even the opposition is made in America. Right? And as I said, it's because, as I said, we live, it's the American empire. And again, in that famous photograph, I always like this, is that this, this pagoda in the back looks like it's China, a large country in East Asia, but actually it's Taiwan pretending to be China because the Chinese did this awful thing of switching sides in in the great game of the Cold War. And so, what, what, what the warning I want to give, and I'm going to rush through the end just for you, is, 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 is actually what, these, what this first history, I say what the other history of given of the internet is somehow it was invented by hippies in Berkeley in the late 60s. Uh, what I want to say is actually t you need to understand this prehistory to understand actually what it led the people who really did fund it, the Cold War left into. So this is from Rostow's stages of economic growth. They had this modernization theory where instead of seeing the world as, you know, you have the core nations and the periphery, it's called imperialism, and, and therefore the, 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 the South is kept backward by the power of the North, is that they saw actually that all the nations were like a sort of like a ships in a convoy with the Americans at the front and Afghanistan at the back, but we were all going in the right direction. If only those evil commies didn't distract people. Um, and of course, this is because the and this is, as I said, it becomes out of the Cold War mentality that the way that they saw the world was as a giant game. As I said, people like Johnny von Neumann invented game theory. And what game theory allowed them to do is to conceive of the Cold War as a game. So instead of actually fighting over rich bits like Europe, which might cause some damage to the world economy, they could go and fight over peasant countries in the South, which are actually got economically worthless, uh, but actually high symbolic value. And the best example of this is Vietnam. Vietnam is a paddy field in Southeast Asia, which, as the US Joint Chief of Staff said, has no economic and no geostrategic interest whatsoever. But it had great symbolic value. It had a very tough rural guerrilla force. So the American army went there to show that they could beat it. Yeah? Uh, so they went to invade. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, and people like Rostow, who by this time had become national security advisor, said, well, we can win a guerrilla war. The French lost it. We can win a war because we have computers. And one of the most obvious things, obviously, in a guerrilla war is how can you work out your winning? Because it's not about seizing territory. And they say, well, we have a computer. We have a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> we're, we're killing more Vietnamese than they are killing of us and our collaborators. Look at this. The charts are looking great, says Rostow. Yeah? We also, of course, have the technology to impose these casualties on them. And this is, we have our computers to plan out our campaigns. We have bombers, we have the helicopters for search and destroy missions. And this, I always think is a wonderful, this is Walt Rostow, who's National Security Advisor, and Lyndon Johnson, who's the then president, uh, planning, you know, which village should we blow up, 
yeah, murder these peasants. They're in the basement of the White House, but they have the internet, effectively. They have, they're in real-time communication with the military, and they're playing like a game. Um, as you said, it looks like a game board, doesn't it? And they're, say, they're directing in real time the American forces in, who are occupying Vietnam. And so for Rostow, of course, the, the virtual world of his computer simulation of uh, looked great. It looked like they were winning. They're going to come to power. And of course, large part of this is you have to think, as I said, it had no economic and geostrategic, but what the point of it was, it was a show of force. Anyway, you know, this is embedded journalism in the 60s. And what, that's, what the idea was that the Americans would go there, kick the shit out of the Vietnamese, and show it live on colour on television. We are the most powerful people on the planet. And show that there is only one path to the future, the American path. But of course the problem was that they lost. Uh, this is the um, last scene of the final episode of the long-running TV series, The Vietnam War. Uh, this is when the uh, Vietnamese tank goes through the gates of the puppet president's palace in Saigon. Unfortunately, of course, the TV crews arrived too late. They'd already liberated the palace. So what they did is they took all the, tr they took all the troops out, put the gates back in, and then reshot it <laughs> for TV. Right? So, it can, you know, this is live on TV. We won. Uh, so this is, in a sense, what I want to say is that this is the warning, that if you believe in your assemblages of semiotic war machines, uh, actually reality can come and hit you in the face. In this case, the rebellious Vietnamese. Uh, but, of course, what's interesting is that actually this theory, McLuhanism, hasn't disappeared. Actually, of all the things of the Cold War left, I mean, they, you know, who reads Rostow now? When I actually ate got things from aid books, I'm always there. Uh, he's, like, he's like two quid, 50p, yeah? So it's, but the, the so Rostow and even Bell, most of people, Galbraith, have forgotten, but the theory, the McLuhanist theory that they pop, is still here. Here we all still are, Virtual Futures 2011. Um, and it's, what's interesting is how it's taken on all these different versions. So the most obvious is the sort of hippie version. You know, that suddenly it reappears as, you know, famously, Abby Hoffman says, you know, in Woodstock Nation, he says, well, once every computer, co television has a computer terminal, we'll be there, we'll be at the hippie revolution. It also, of course, has taken on the sort of dot-com version, uh, the Silicon Valley model. That actually it's the, you know, not the VC doesn't mean Viet Cong, it means venture capitalist, yeah? Uh, that actually McLuhanism is the prediction of the triumph of neoliberalism. Um, it's what me and Andy Cameron called in 1995 the Californian ideology, the way that they mix this sort of hippie, uh, both the new left and the new right together. Um, and, uh, and of course there is some rationality in this because actually... You know, the way that the, in, because it was originally cybernetic communism, that's what it was in the 1950s, it still has it within it. That actually things like copyright are very difficult to enforce. The fact that it's mainly based on people sharing information with each other, not selling information with each other. But as I said, I think we just need to think about, uh, you know, this particular. If you don't remember the future, you might commit you know, you might repeat it. I mean, and the most obvious example is the invasion of Iraq, where I saw lots of new Labour people who knew the best, and they said, well, we must follow America into this disastrous invasion, because they are the future. Now, America is the future, it owns the future, therefore we have to follow them. They are the future. And so we get this repeat of the past again and again. Of course, we can use these technologies for good reasons. So I'm not against technology, let me emphasise this. Uh, you know, the, the protests that were organised in 2003, like today in Athens, uh, are being organised using these very technologies. What my friend John Barker called the, the creation of a critical mass intelligence cr around, around these ideas. Uh, and obviously we can see the way that even with the, the big corporate players, the Facebooks and the MySpaces and the YouTube, ironically are providing a platform 
for a lot of the dissemination. You know, they, they might provide us with the software and the service space, but we're actually creating the content. And I was always like to say, ironically, it's dot-com and communism in the service of cybernetic communism. Uh, but I think what I, the real message I want to say here is actually about the imaginary future itself. Last slide. Uh, the imaginary future itself is in a sense that we've got there, that the real prediction about the global village. Now that everybody's got a mobile, in the, in the developed world, has got a mobile phone, has connectivity, has computing, is that the persistence of this prediction that of the imaginary future is precisely obsolete. And so this is, then the message I want to say is the future is now. And therefore, the real important task, and hopefully I want you to go away, is, is that we must invent new futures. Thank you.